unfortunately in our uh, subcontinent of india we try to subscribe to a single authority for example if somebody has written a book for the entrance preparation we tend to think that those answers are correct or those answers are totally wrong some kind of ambivalence prevails within us but honestly remember doctor any teacher or any writer has got a limitation because it is his perspective towards those questions they can have few errors in the interpretation so there is a reason uh, you always make your own assessment and reference so there is a reason i'll give you the possible answers with the best references available so in spite of that if you can find some number of errors uh, always you are welcome to express it so then only when there is a error then only there is a science otherwise uh, it becomes only social studies so we are in the medical science right so let us continue our discussion amyloid deposit stains positively with which of the following stains all of you know congruent is what we were studying from the robins pathology days of our mbbs so there is no surprise about it and all of you know pneumocystis carinii pneumonia and methylamine silver stain there's a reason all of you tend to answer it as methylamine silver in fact that is true also but also you need to remember thioflavin t and the congruent they are the two important things typically which deposits histologically are defined as amyloid deposits are they extracellular or intracellular is my question to all of you the extracellular thioflavin positive deposits which show the birefringence of apple green when stained with the congruent when seen under the polarizing microscope is a classical description of the amyloid is something which you should not basically forget there is a very important method of staining the amyloid called the sodium sulfate alcyon blue method otherwise called the sad method by this method the amyloid will be staining green in fact if you take congruent or crystal violet or thioflavin it is the sad method which is considered to be more superior is what we need to basically understand so this shows you typically in the renal interstitium and the tubular basement membrane the deposition of the amyloid is what you are able to see this classical typical apple green birefringence is something of these deposits uh, which you should not basically forget similarly there can be a massive deposition of the amyloid within the arteries and the arterioles of uh, the blood vessels once there is a renal involvement in the amyloid osseous in fact one of the common causes for the death in the clinical course of the systemic amyloid osseous is number one the infection number two is the renal involvement is something uh, which you should not basically forget typically if you take an electron microscopy there will be a sub epithelial spikes like this of the amyloid deposition which are uh, unforgettable similarly what is the typical description of the amyloid deposition in the kidney to add one more uh, aspect to your uh, understanding it's a nodular deposition and whenever you find a nodular deposit in the kidney what are the three important differential diagnosis which you should not forget number one is amyloidosis of the kidney and a diabetic glomerulosclerosis where as a end stage renal disease diabetes clinical course will be finally ending into and the light chain deposition disease and the idiopathic uh, membrano proliferative glomerulonephritis are the four important differential diagnosis for the nodular involvement of the glomerulus is what i want to underscore to all of you similar amyloid kidney also can cause a mesangial deposition of the amyloid uh, as what you have seen in the histology now let us go to the next question crystalline lens typically derives its nutrition from where it is from the aqueous and vitreous is something uh, which you should not basically forget so this gives you the typical high magnification of how the crystalline lens ciliary body and the jonules all of them typically look like so how do you like to describe the crystalline lens it is a unique transparent biconvex intraocular structure which will be lying within the anterior segment of the eye is what need to be remembered and it is all those jonular fibers in the ciliary bodies are the ones which will be suspending it along the equator and typically it is located between the iris and the vitreous body is what you have to be very clear about now if you take this crystalline lens it is enclosed in an elastic capsule there's a reason it is not having any innervation 
and it is also not having any blood supply is what you have to fundamentally understand so when it does not have the blood supply it need to depend upon the surrounding aqueous and the vitreous not only for the, the nutritional requirements also for the excretion of the metabolic waste products also it is dependent upon uh, the aqueous and vitreous is what i want to underscore to all of you that is the reason if there is any problem with the vitreous for example persistent hyperplastic vitreous is one of the important congenital condition in this the problem in the vitreous will impair the nourishment and the excretion of the lens of the crystalline lens so there is a reason there is a development of a cataract as a complication because of the pathology in the vitreous similarly pathology of the aqueous also leads to the typical histopathological changes within the lens is what you need to basically understand now there are two important uh, anatomical structures which you have to basically understand there is a very important space called berger space which can be a potential mcq into the future typically it is between the condensed vitreous and the capsule of this crystalline lens the space between these two is called the berger space is what you need to basically remember and there is another important thing called ligamentum hyaloidio capsulate typically in the young eyes when the vitreous comes in contact with the posterior capsule of the lens then it typically forms what is called the ligamentum hyaloidio capsulate is what need to be remembered so finally you are all with me that aqueous and vitreous are the source of uh, both the energy and also an exit for the excretion of the lens is what you need to fundamentally remember let's go to the next question band shaped keratopathy so all of you agree that band shaped keratopathy is a stock topic and a stock question so let us identify how many questions are maverick and how many are traditional and conventional if you look so nearly 90% of the questions are conventional so there is a reason doctor solving the past 7 years of all india aims question papers and also at least one reading of all the major topics in all your textbooks after the close go for a honeymoon and then go and write the exam automatically you will get it so only thing is uh, if there are any filling defects in our preparation this is the best time the april and may is the best time to be more extensive now let us talk about the band shaped keratopathy what you are seeing here is all the calcium deposition which is typically she seen in the eye which is showing the band shaped keratopathy typically this calcium will be depositing in the 3 o'clock and the 9 o'clock position in the front layer of the cornea and this uh, deposition will be spreading like a band now what predisposes for this calcium deposition any inflammation of the cornea similarly any trauma to the cornea any chronic ocular disease sometimes in the systemic diseases it is quite common now i'll give you a short case presentation a 6 year old girl has presented to her general practitioner because of the problem of uh, the red left eye red eye is one important problem as a physician you can come across if you are working in the rheumatology department and also as an ophthalmologist you need to know what is the differential diagnosis for the red eye she reported that there is no pain or there is no irritation and she has got a difficulty in seeing the objects and there is a blurring of vision in that affected eye in addition to that there is a onset of the neck stiffness with the limitation of the flexion of the neck and the rotation of the neck and this problem of flexion of the neck limitation is gradually progressing over the preceding one month and it is becoming more problematic in the morning hours there is no history of fever rashes git or genito urinary symptoms now i like to ask you a question when there is a red eye and when there is a limitation of the flexion of the neck why do you want to ask for the history of git and genito urinary symptoms now let us ask dr nagraj is our consultant uh, ophthalmologist today rheumatologist today yes doctor any meningitis, any meningitis is a very good uh, contemplation possibility number 1 a little more you extend your uh, thinking across the cmdd 2006 from this end to that end doctor typically a young girl of course 6 years is looking little atypical with what uh, i am contemplating as a possibility what is the important situation where eye involvement with the stiffness of the neck with the arthritis with the rheumatological manifestations can be there 
So one of the seronegative spondyloarthropathies can have the involvement of the eye is something which you should not forget. And why I want to ask genital urinary is any reactive arthritis can also be there. So it can be following any dysentric episode or following any urethritis. So that is the reason these symptoms are very important. Now, this is the typical appearance in that left eye, doctor. This arrow you are able to see. The presence of this band-shaped keratopathy is what you are able to see clearly over here. So this is a classical example. And this is a typical eye which is having the inflammation of the iris. That is the reason acute anterior uveitis, this typical appearance is unforgettable. So anterior uveitis, band-shaped keratopathy, these are all very important. And uh, typically this band-shaped keratopathy which is observed in her eye is involving the visual axis. So there is a reason there is a blurring of the vision. And the child's vision continued to deteriorate so she was started on the topical dexamethasone and uh, atropine. At this instant, the a rheumatologist suspected a possibility of a connective tissue disorder. So the child is also having elevated ESR, the C-reactive protein was within the normal limits, ANA is negative, DSDNA is negative. So there is a reason there is less likely possibility of a SLE in this given situation. So what do you want to diagnose finally? It is a case of juvenile idiopathic arthritis uh, which can have band shaped keratopathy as an ophthalmological presentation is what you need to basically understand. So when she was given a pulse methyl prednisolone therapy, by the time it is the final dose of that intravenous methyl prednisolone, totally her intraocular pressure came to normal, band shaped keratopathy has partially resolved and the next symptoms also have resolved. Once more to say, band shaped keratopathy with the calcium deposition is not a permanent feature or irreversible feature. It is a reversible feature if you can identify the underlying connective tissue disorder associated with the band shaped keratopathy as the idiopathic arthritis here and start in time the pulse methyl prednisolone is what I want to once more underscore to all of you. This once more shows you the band shape of the subepithelial deposition in the intrapalpable region of the band shaped keratopathy. Now, what are the important conditions you have to keep in mind whenever you come across a case which has got a band shaped keratopathy? Ocular diseases like the juvenile chronic arthritis, this is bulby, interstitial keratitis, oil keratopathy and chronic ocular disease, all these are the possible ophthalmological reasons. Similarly, any reason leading to the development of the hypercalcemia, for example, hyperparathyroidism or the vitamin D toxicity or the sarcoidosis, in all these conditions, systemic causes for the development of the band-shaped keratopathy. Similarly, chronic renal failure is another important condition and uh, idiopathic can be rarely. Now, when do you want to do a surgery in a given case of the band-shaped keratopathy? Whenever it is cosmetically unacceptable, if there is a visual disturbance or if there is any pain because of the breakdown of the corneal epithelium, which is innervated typically by the trigeminal, so in that scenario you want to do the surgery is what I want to underscore to all of you. Especially in the young children, there is a chance of interstitial keratitis, for example syphilitic uh, in its origin can lead to the development of uh, the band shaped keratopathy. So that is the reason you look for it. Similarly, if the patient is young, especially female, also you look for the sign of the arthritis, aqueous case, pseudophakia, all these things associated is what I want to underscore to all of you. So how do you want to repair that band of the calcium which is located on the uh, cornea? It is the eczema laser and EDTA which are considered to be the treatment of choice for the management of uh, band-shaped keratopathy. So in future, any exam in this country, if the question comes on band-shaped keratopathy, now you are all encyclopedic doctor. Let us go to the next question. Bitemporal hemianopic field defect is characteristic of which important condition? Once more, visual field defects is one topic doctor we extensively discussed in the neuroanatomy. You have to revise, understand first of all what is the definition of each of these various uh, visual fields and uh, what is the anatomical basis for it. Now I will make you the masters. The most common cause for the development of the bitemporal hemianopia is the pituitary adenoma is something which you should not uh, basically forget. Now I like to ask you a question. 
I am showing you the typical vision of one of the patients. Can you comment if the patient is seeing the visual field like this, what type of visual field and where is the possibly the lesion? Do you want to place the lesion at the level of the optic nerve or at the level of the optic chiasma or at the level of the temporal lobe? But basically what is this you are finding? Let us ask our consultant Dr. Raghuram, take up this uh, visual challenge to you doctor. Uh, what is this uh, patch which is appearing centrally? Wonderful, it is a major central scotoma is what you are finding. And it is because of the disorders of the optic nerve is something which you should not basically forget. Now once more, let us uh, take up this next visual challenge to you. So let us ask uh, uh, Dr. Siri Sharma, what is your good name doctor? Pavani, Dr. Pavani is going to answer. Please see, please see. So, do you like to call it as bitemporal hemianopia or a homonymous hemianopia? Do you like to call it as because there are two fields on the same side which got uh, affected. So, same side visual fields got affected means it is called homonymous hemianopia. Now, what is this visual field where the opposite, uh, I mean uh, these two fields got affected typically is called as. It is called as the, what is this, the, it is the same visual uh, defect which I am showing to you. So, what is this visual defect called as doctor? It is the bitemporal field defect which is uh, present. Uh, so, one of the common causes for developing a bitemporal hemianopsy of this nature is because of this fellow, little fellow called pituitary adenoma who is the one who is compressing the optic chiasma leading to the loss of both sides temporal fields is what I want to underscore to all of you. So generally if you look at the progression of the visual field defects because of the pituitary adenoma, at the early stages of the pituitary adenoma you don't find a florid bitemporal hemianopia. Initially you find a superior quadrant anopia, following that there is a development of a bitemporal hemianopia, still you could not be able to recognize and did not do a proper neurological examination and took a MRI of the brain and identified the pituitary adenoma then finally the patient will be progressing to complete blindness is what you need to basically remember. So now we are all very sure, let's go to the next question. Lights, pupillary reflex, typically what is the afferent pathway? So you throw the torch and the pupil constricts and also the other pupil also constricts due to the consensual pupillary light reaction. So for the whole of that process you require first of all the optic nerve and the retina to be intact. So there is a reason the afferent pathway is from the optic nerve is what need to be basically be remembered and from the optic nerve it will be reaching the chiasma and from the chiasma it will be reaching the midbrain and from there the edinger westphal nucleus and finally it will be reaching the ciliary ganglion and that will be mediating the constriction of the pupil once you are throwing the light into the retina. So one question invariably comes on the light reflex doctor so that you that's the reason you have to be doubly sure where is the inferior colliculus located where is superior colliculus located all these things we have extensively discussed in the neuroanatomy session what is the rating among the first five questions for unconventional questions doctor i don't think so till now we have come across unconventional questions this is all conventional so let's go to the next question fracture ella signature is typically seen in which type of fracture? So I like to ask you a question, what is this fracture which you are seeing here doctor? It is typically a depressed fracture on the right parietal bone. So fracture ella signature is an example of a depressed fracture is what you need to basically understand. Can depressed fracture can speak anything about what happened uh, anti-mortem to the patient doctor? It speaks about the manner of the infliction of the injury, the type of the weapon used and the relative position of the assailant while he is uh, attacking the victim at the time of the incident, all these things are spoken. But uh, some of you may ask, can't it be gutter fracture? So gutter is also basically a depressed fracture, but it is a long narrow depressed fracture is what need to be remembered. So the classical description for the fracture ella signature would be a depressed fracture is what you need to understand. Let's go to the next question. A dead body is having a cadaveric lividity of the blue-green color and what is the most likely cause of this poisoning? So this is one of the traditional questions, post-mortem lividity we already discussed in the last Sunday test also while our counterparts are taking their AIMS entrance exam. So there's a reason 
uh, not, without much of repetition, uh, I'll mention a few of the important points. Typically, if you look at the lividity, it will be purple or reddish purple in color. And the lividity in the bodies which are exposed to the air, typically will be acquiring a pink color at the sides is a very important rule. And typically, those parts of the body which are in the close contact with the ground, they will not be showing the lividity is a very, very important rule. If you take the carbon monoxide poisoning, the typical color of the lividity would be cherry red. And if you take the nitrates, aniline, and the potassium chlorate, all these three drugs will be leading to the development of the methemoglobin. So that is the reason, doctor, there the post-mortem lividity will be having the chocolate brown color is something which you should not forget. Similarly, if somebody has gone to the honeymoon and committed a suicide in Leh or Ladakh in the middle of Himalayas, what will be the type of the lividity by the time he is flown back to the Hyderabad on uh, Indian Airlines? It will be bright pink in color is what you need to basically remember. So that way, typically the color of the lividity will give us a identity about which is the type of the poisoning. So in the cyanide poisoning, it is the pink color, bright scarlet color and the violet color. There are different colors which were described in the cyanide poisoning is what need to be remembered. So there's a reason, doctor. Post-mortem lividity is one of the favorite and stock topic for the examiner. Let's go to the next question. When a surgeon wants to send an autopsy specimen for the virological examination, in which solution should he preserve it? Basically, one of the important rules in autopsy is if you are suspecting a viral cause or viral examination need to be done, don't add any preservative is the golden rule. So there is a reason, doctor, by exclusion, I consider possibility of saturated solution of the common salt as a possibility. So if you have got a better reference, you can just uh, pass it on to me. Let's go to the next question. Fingerprint pattern typically will be lost once there is any leprosy is a very important thing. So deep cuts and injuries involving all the layers of the epidermis and some of the diseases like the leprosy, they are all the important reasons where the fingerprint uh, can be lost is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, Gustafsson's method of the age estimation, which is the most reliable feature. Once more, this is also another favorite topic of the examiner. There is no surprise about it. So basically, you need to remember, doctor, in the tooth, there are some important things which are used in estimation of the age. One is the transparency of the tooth. And similarly, the uh, gingival uh, morphology is another important thing. So these are uh, some of the important features. And uh, the transparency of the root is another important feature. So it was the Gustafsson who was the first person to basically devise, based upon histological examination of the grounded thin sections of the teeth, he has used 0 0.3. I mean, three point uh, scales, 0, 1, 2, 3. And he evaluated the extent of six important changes in the tooth in order to estimate the age. Now, what are the six important criteria of the Gustafsson? The degree of attrition, that is called A, is very, very important. Similarly, the position of the epithelial attachment, otherwise called G, is another important. And amount of the secondary dentin, the thickness of the cementum, the degree of the absorption of the resorption of the root, and the transparency of the root dentin, these are all considered to be the important criteria. But out of all these, doctor, it is the transparency of the root which is considered to be the most reliable among the Gustafsson criteria is what you need to basically understand. Now, what is the ideal place to record the body temperature in the dead body? This is another favorite question based upon uh, the rectal temperature fall you can assess the amount of the time that has already elapsed after the death in the subcontinent. So there is a reason doctor, uh, post-mortem how much amount of time has elapsed can be calculated. So this is another stock topic only. So rectum is one important area from where uh, it is being uh, 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 calculated is what need to be remembered. So let's go to the next question. Priapism typically is associated with which important poisoning? I could not get a very standard answer for this. So if you have, uh, I like to appreciate uh, once you provide to me. Let's go to the next question. What is the type of the endometrial hyperplasia with the endometrial carcinoma? The chances are very, very high. So once more, what are the risk factors for the endometrial carcinoma? 
and what is the staging of the endometrial carcinoma? Do you want to do surgery? Do you want to give radiotherapy? These are all the favorite areas for the examiner. So, now let us talk about this important topic. Typically, if you look at the endometrial hyperplasia, it is being divided into four important types. The simple type, the complex type, the simple atypical type and the complex atypical type are the four different types of the endometrial hyperplasia. If you typically look at the chances of progression towards the carcinoma, it is 1% with the simple hyperplasia, 3% with the complex and 29% with complex atypical hyperplasia. That is the reason, doctor, without any dispute. It is the complex hyperplasia with type IPI is considered to be the most uh, significant risk factor for the development of the endometrial carcinoma is what need to be remembered. So this gives you the typical appearance of the simple hyperplasia of the endometrium without any kind of the type IPI. And what you can see here is all these hyperplastic glands, some of them have developed uh, the dilatation and also you can see the presence of the stroma which has undergone the hyperplasia. So tomorrow as a pathologist and gynecologist or if you are going to do your post-graduation, there is a very common sample of slide which is being sent to you and there is a lot of eagerness also to know because if it is endometrial malignancy or if it is a complex hyperplasia with atypia, totally there is a different prognosis for the patient compared to that of the simple hyperplasia. So there is a reason you have to be doubly sure about. Now a very important question arises here. If the patient is having the hyperplasia without atypia, how do you want to manage the patient? Do you want to do hysterectomy? Do you want to do endometrial um, surgery? What is the type of procedure that you want to basically do? Whenever there is a hyperplasia without any atypia and typically the patient is unstable or unable to take the progestins as the treatment, in that scenario, no watching and waiting, hysterectomy can be carried on. Otherwise, if the patient is uh, desiring to retain her uterus, then in that case, medroxy progesterone is considered to be the treatment of choice. It needs to be administered for about uh, 14 days during uh, each month. And you need to repeat once more the endometrial biopsy after about 3 months. At the end of the 3 months, once more if there is a persistent hyperplasia, Administer has a high dose progesterone like the medroxy progesterone 40 to 100 milligrams daily for about 3 months and once more repeat the biopsy. In spite of that if there is a persistent hyperplasia then go ahead with a hysterectomy. Suppose initially there was no atypia but after you have waited for about 3 months and administered progesterone and the patient later on on the repeat biopsy is showing atypia then there is nothing to wait. There it is once more the indication for going ahead with a hysterectomy. Suppose if the patient has developed atrophic endometrium after the end of about 3 months, then the patient is a responder to your progesterone therapy and in her you can continue the medroxy progesterone 5 mg daily for uh, about 10 days each month for about 12 months uh, and later on after 12 months you can think of endometrial biopsy. So there is a reason doctor is one of the important uh, diagnostic algorithm which you have to be doubly sure. So two important carry home messages, medroxy progesterone is considered to be a wonderful investigation to make the patient to wait and not to knock out the uterus is a very important rule which you should not forget. Let's go to the next question. The risk of Asherman syndrome is typically highest if the dilatation the curettage is done for which important condition. Basically, after you have carried on the procedure of the curettage, Every patient does not develop the adhesions. But if the endometrium at the time of your curettage is highly vascular in nature, there is a high propensity and proclivity towards development of uh, the Asherban's adhesions. So can you tell me, Doctor, one important situation where the endometrium will be highly vascular in nature? It is in the postpartum period during which endometrium will be extremely vascular and very sensitive to the procedure of the curettage. That's the reason there is a high chance of developing uh, the Asherman syndrome as a complication is what need to be remembered. Once more, there are two important risk factors. If there is endometritis and on such a uterus and endometrium, if you have carried on the dilatation curettage, there is a high chance of developing additions. Similarly, if there is any uterine infection, typically in the postpartum period also, it is considered a highly vulnerable period is what I want to underscore to all of you. So finally, the postpartum period is the time where if at all dilatation curettage is done for whatever be the indication, 
there is a high chance of developing the acid man is what need to be remembered now quickly tell me doctor what are all the important indications where you want to do this important procedure and the acid man syndrome can develop Elective termination of pregnancy, caesarean section, post caesarean, there can be a development of endometrial adhesions, myomectomy, metroplasty, and pelvic inflammatory disease, pelvic tuberculosis, and cystosomiasis. In all these conditions, there can be development of uh, the Asher bands as a complication, is what you need to fundamentally understand. Let's go to the next question. What is the type of the viral hepatitis whose infection in the pregnancy can be fatal? All of you know the answer is hepatitis E, which is the most common cause. But if I ask you a question, otherwise which is most common cause? Forget about pregnancy. Overall, what is the most common cause for the fulminant hepatic failure? What is your answer, doctor? It is not hepatitis E. Hepatitis E, otherwise if it is not a pregnant uh, patient, it is a very benign condition like hepatitis A. So overall, fulminant hepatic failure, if you take the most common cause is hepatitis B is what you need to remember. But if it is a pregnant woman, definitely it is the hepatitis E is what you need to fundamentally understand. Let's go to the next question. What is the best way that you can prevent the development of the DVT in the post-operative period? Some of you may argue with me, if I give prophylactic heparin post-operatively, there can be a development of bleeding. So there is a reason, shall I give or shall I not give? Don't worry, there are a lot of recommendations and research which, is, which has gone into this very important fact. Basically, you grade a surgical patient into a low risk, moderate risk and high risk patients. That is risk for developing not the bleeding diathesis, thrombotic tendency. So whenever there is a high risk patient, absolutely there is no contraindication for initiating the heparin. Once more, do you want to choose a low molecular weight heparin? subcutaneously or do you want to choose uh, a unfractionated heparin 5000 international units uh, um, is the one which is the another important regime basically they don't differ in their efficacy the low molecular weight is as good as that of the high molecular weight but the high molecular weight heparin therapy can be complicated with the development of thrombocytopenia as a complication which is not so with the case of uh, the low molecular weight heparin is the major advantage is what you have to basically understand. So hemorrhagic side effects are very uncommon especially with the subcutaneous heparin only 2% on average. That's the reason doctor, if you have an obese patient who is having a high tendency, similarly a patient who has got an internal malignancy on whom you are operating which is another important thrombotic condition Forget about the bleeding diathesis of the heparin. If it arises, we can start protamine and uh, stop the heparin. You have to start the heparin in the post-operative period is a very important rule which you should not uh, basically forget. Let's go to the next question. In the Manning scoring system of the biophysical profile, which parameter is not included? Once more, is it conventional or unconventional? Absolutely conventional. So there is a reason, doctor. Uh, if you sit in a flight, you will be thinking, uh, what is this? How can this pilot fellow can take us, take off, drop down and all? But that fellow will be happily be sailing in the um, flight. What is the reason? For him it is a day in and day out affair. So also for you doctor when you go for the exam, you must be like that pilot in the cockpit where your hands are having a perfect control on the steering of the entrance and uh, your OMR sheet. You should not suddenly find a question as a big surprise and start thinking and calculating about the question. So, when will it be possible if you happen to revise all the stock topics and questions? So, now let us talk about the Manning score. Typically, one of the important components is the fetal tone in calculation of the Manning score. How can you identify the fetal tone is my question to all of you. If you do the ultrasound of the abdomen and uh, happen to do the ultrasound of the fetus, you can see the hand is in the extension. And once more, you can also see the hand is going into the flexion. So this is only possible if the fetus is having a very good amount of tone. So ultrasound can help you to assess the fetal tone. So many fetal breathing movements are very, very important. So this M mode of the ultrasound can enable you to know how the fetal breathing is going on. Once more, for calculating of the Manning score, you require the fetal ultrasound. So many the amniotic fluid the pocket of the amniotic fluid is the one which is uh, calculated what is the vertical height of it. 
so what you are able to see is here is one cursor marker this is another cursor marker between the two you are able to see the amniotic fluid pocket and you try to calculate what is the height of it which will give you an idea about the adequacy of the amount of the amniotic fluid which is there so there is a reason doctor in the biophysical profile scoring of the manning which had been proposed uh, typically there are uh, five important components the fetal movements they must be greater than three body or limb movements similarly fetal tone there must be at least one episode of active extension and flexion which you have seen just now on the ultrasound how it looks like similarly the fetal breathing movements there must be at least greater than one episode of greater than 30 seconds in duration in over 30 minutes of observation period is very important similarly amniotic fluid volume that is uh, 2 cm into 2 cm pocket is important and the non stress test that is uh, two accelerations greater than 15 beat per minute must be there in at least uh, 15 seconds of duration is uh, considered to be adequate uh, amount to say that there is a fetal well-being by using the manning score is what I want to underscore. So finally what is your answer doctor? Fetal tone is included, body movements are included, there is a non-stress test, there is no oxytocin challenge test in calculating the manning score is what I want to underscore to all of you. So. Now you are very sure, when you walk into your internship in obstetrics posting, you are going to check for the manning score of at least one fetus in lifetime, you will not forget. So that way doctor, your preparation and your internship must supplement and complement each other. Let's go to the next question. Pseudomyxoma peritonei typically occurs as a complication of which ovarian tumor? Once more our favorite uh, Murphy's law. Without ovarian tumor, there is no entrance. Without carcinoma cervix, there is no entrance. Case control trial, specificity, sensitivity. These are all the topics uh, without which there is no question paper. So, mucinous cystadenoma, typically a patient who has got a pseudomyxoma peritoneae, if you take a CD scan of the abdomen, this is a typical appearance which is unforgettable. Intraoperatively, the tumor will be coating the lining of the abdomen with a jelly-like substance in the case of the pseudomyxoma peritoneae. And uh, it is the mucinous tumors which are uh, liable to lead to the development of pseudomyxoma peritoneae. Let's go to the next question. A 27 year old primary gravida presents with a pregnancy induced hypertension with a blood pressure of about 150 by 100 millimeters of mercury at 32 weeks of gestation with no other complication. Subsequently her blood pressure is brought into control and if there are no other complications do you want to continue the pregnancy if so till what duration is a very important question. First thing is at 32 weeks only can you deliver? If the fetus is sufficient enough that it is eligible for postgraduate entrance exam if delivered at 32 weeks is my question to all of you. Or should it wait for completion of some more number of weeks? How long should we take care if possible without complications by giving the medical therapy? At least you can prolong by another two weeks. If at all there are no further complications, there is a reason possibility of 34 could be the answer. But uh, I still need some more literature support to support this answer. Let us go to the next question. A 13 year old young girl presents with the acute pain in the lower abdomen and she has got the history of the cyclical pain for the last 6 months and she has not attained her mean arc yet and there is a tense bulge in the region of the hymen then what is the possibility in this given case? Now whenever there is a absence of the onset of the menses you need to look for whether the other sexual secondary characters they are well developed or not. So that is how your differential diagnosis will proceed. In this given case, on the local, uh, in this young girl, typically the problem is she is not able to achieve the mean arc and there is a cyclical pain for the last six months. It can't be Asher man, let us take it out of the options given to you. Now you are only thinking whether it is Rokitansky Kastner-Hausner syndrome where there is a Mullerian abnormalities with the, with the vaginal agenesis as a possibility versus there is an imperforate hymen. Anyway, the pervaginal examination typically is showing the presence of uh, a bulge in the region of the hymen. That's the reason it is more supportive for you to consider the possibility of the imperforate hymen in this given case. But one two comments about the Rokitansky syndrome. There is a vaginal atresia with the other Mullerian duct abnormalities will be there. And typically the patient will be presenting with the primary amenorrhea. But here there is no problem with the ovaries. So there is a reason. There is a normal sexual female development uh, but the only thing is there is no mean arc that is happening is a major problem. In fact, if I ask you a question, 
What is the most common cause for the primary amenorrhea? It is the Turner syndrome with the ovarian dysgenesis. The second most common cause you should not forget is the mayer rokitansky kastner hausner syndrome is what need to be basically be understood. Even the patient with the Rokitansky syndrome also will be complaining of abdominal pain on a cyclical basis and because the ovarian function is normal, all the other bodily changes are present but uh, there is absence of menstruation. Now in these patients, the height will be normal, speculum examination of the vagina is difficult, rather impossible because of the presence of the vaginal agenesis is what need to be remembered. But in them, if you do a local genital examination, the labia majora, minora, cateris, vulva, all these things are normal in their development is what need to be understood. So finally, our option is uh, imperforate uh, hymen is the most uh, possible situation here because of the clinical examination finding.